Hello, I am Raleigh Klotzek and I am a guide with the San Francisco Fuel Raven shop and I'm really excited to show you the process of greenwood spoon carving. So uh, in this first video, what we're going to focus on is the axing part um, where I go from a log to a spoon blank, which is roughly the shape of a spoon and it's before I pick up my knife. I do the entire process with hand tools and I'm using green wood, which means that it's been harvested and not dried out. Um, you can find wood so many places. I have managed to find wood um, and know many people that find wood in the city and the surrounding area. Be you know, trees come down, you can contact arborists, um, even I think you can contact city, um, you know, I don't know the specific name, but the people that would maintain, you know, city foliage and trees. And you start to get this like keen ear for the sound of a chainsaw <laughs> or something. Um, firstly, pardon, there's also some axing going on. My husband also does green woodwork. So if you hear that, <clears throat> excuse that, it's all part of the <laughs> aesthetic. <laughs> so let's go over the tools that I use first. So one of the first things that you will need is an ax block. This can be a log. Um, this can also be something that looks like this that we have shaped to support with the spoon carving process. Um, we've put in three legs. Three legs is better than four because it is easier to find level ground with three, like a tripod, than with four, it's harder to balance. And this can be a very rough kind of construction as long as it's stable that's the most important thing and I have it at about my pelvis hip uh, bone height um, as I said you can also use a log on its side and if you sit down um, you'll just swing your knees to the side so that you are not having the axe close to the inside of your legs so if you don't have an axe block yet a log works. You can also find tall logs. We've also done that before. Um, so you may not even need legs. And also if you're really interested in this process and you don't have, you know, the tools of an ax and a saw and a mallet or an ax block, you can also order spoon blanks either from me or from some other people that I can link below in the information. And then you can do the knife carving work, which we'll do in a later video. So you need your ax block. The next tool that you need is some kind of wedge. This is called a fro. I hope everything is focused. This is a fro. And I will use this to split the log. If you don't have a fro, you can also use an ax, which will be your main tool. So you can use the ax just like you would um, this fro or a wedge to split the log. The other probably most primitive tool is a mallet. This was just a piece of hardwood at one point. Well, it still is a piece of hardwood. <laughs> um, I believe this is a piece of cherry and we, you know, axed out so we can grip it. And this is for hitting the fro or the ax and splitting the log, you don't want to hit metal on metal. So you don't want to use um, a metal hammer or a other kind of ax or um, kind of rough woodland or gardening tool to hit the back of your ax or your fro. It's more likely to loosen the, like these joints, the wedge between handle and um, iron. So you want to use a wooden mallet this is probably, you know, starting and making one of these is probably the easiest place to start. Maybe we'll do that in another video too. Next is I have a hand saw. This is anything you can get at a local hardware or gardening shop. Um, there's also some nicer ones. The brand of a nicer saw that I would recommend is called Silky. Um, I will also note that in information below or an accompanying document um, and they're just they're just really nice blades this one is not a silky it's a 
basic hand saw and it does the trick. Um, I already showed you the axe. There's a wide variety of axes that you can get out there. I would recommend sending me a message and we can talk about axes. Um, Grams Fours is available at Fjall Raven. Um, they'll be getting a resupply of axes that are probably in this size or even potentially a little smaller, which isn't ideal, but if that's what you have access to, do that. There's also um, a Grands Fours axe that has the same head, but a little bit longer handle. I've recently started using this one and I really like it. Um, outside of that, there are many other kinds of axes and what you're looking for is a narrow bevel so it's used for woodwork um, because like if you get an axe just from the hardware store the edge or the bevel sharp edge is more like a wedge and less for cutting so getting a woodworking axe is best if you do get one of the basic um, axes from a hardware store you can resharpen it and narrow that blade um, I've often used those for teaching and it was actually what I learned with originally so it can be very viable you'll just want to get it resharpened or resharpen it and grind it down yourself next is a pencil or a pen a sharpie um, what kind of the most one of the most reliable things um, even though I kind of use whatever I have on hand are garden pens um, because they draw on wood easily um, and specifically on wet wood whereas other pencils will kind of stop being effective same thing with some pens they'll stop drawing on the wood but you can experiment use what you have often the best tool is the tool that you have <laughs> here is a variety of uh, templates that I've made these I've made out of old like yogurt containers or dish soap containers, the like thick plastic. Um, I cut it out into a square. Um, this is also something maybe I can show in a future video. Those are great for the process for consistency because I remember when I started, it's quite, it can be quite challenging to draw the shape of a spoon onto wood. It's not something that you practice and I remember it being very awkward when I started. <laughs> but it all gets easier with time. Remember to drink water and coffee, or whatever you prefer. So, here we have a birch log. Now this is well longer than I need. Um, I could probably get about four spoons out of this, but that depends on length. Am I gonna do an eating spoon, which is, you know, about six to eight inches? This is more the shape of an eating spoon, or a serving spoon, or a cooking spoon, teaspoons, um, scoops, butter spreaders. There's so many things that you can do with the skills that I'm going to show you. I am going to work with a cooking spoon because I find that the larger size is actually easier to work with than a small eating spoon. And the ergonomics of the spoon are less necessary or important. When you're making an eating spoon, you want it to be comfortable in the hand and in the mouth, um, whereas a cooking spoon can be a bit more rough and a great place to start, I believe. So I'm going to look at the wood for a few different things. First, I'm going to look for things like branches. So here there is a branch and it's coming down the side and that will make the grain move around it'll be harder to carve it'll be harder to follow the grain and so i'm going to look for those i'm going to try to avoid those these may be issues but i think they're old enough that they just might be on the surface so i'm not so worried i'm also going to look for any existing cracks which i don't see any um yeah if I were to see some existing cracks in the end, I would try and orient the, the split that I make in the wood with that crack. You can't always be successful as that. Sometimes the crack is this direction on one end and then the other direction on the other end. So you, you know, you're working with a natural organic material that is still very much living. Um, so 
you can't control all of it. Um, in, in ideal situations, I will work with wood that isn't just freshly taken down because when it's just taken down, there's still a lot of movement that can happen. I don't want it to dry out, so I'll leave it in long lengths. Um, I don't always work with small logs like this, so working with tree trunks can mean that there's going to be less warp and um, changing in the shape of your spoon as it's drying. And so if you take down a tree or you're you have a friend that takes down a tree um, or the city or anywhere that you're getting wood um, and you're able to get a log, keep it as long as you can comfortably keep it and let it rest for a few weeks. Um, you can even, you know, depending on the size of the log, you I can have, and the kind of wood, you can have a log that stays green for a year and as long as it's you know in a cool place where it's not rotting again type of wood there's so many little details and you don't have to stress over it but you know hearing it come out of me you'll have some foundation so as you continue learning you'll remember oh yeah that was mentioned and you can learn more about it later or it might inspire you to ask some questions okay so here with this birch log um also, with this case, I might take off a little of either end and just work, you know, with this. So if I want a serving spoon, I might take off both ends and use a length like that for my cooking spoon. So in order to do that, I'm going to use the saw. I'm going to rotate this for a moment. So professional. Okay, I'm gonna rotate this to show when you have an axe block, when you have an axe block with a shoulder like this, it can make it a little easier to saw. Let me mark where this is. And that's about this cooking spoon, it's about 11 or 12 inches. Great tip in general when you're doing any kind of craft or housework or building is learn, measure the distance of your fingers. Like I know that this is nine inches, measure the, the distance of your foot, your arm span. Um, so when you don't have a measuring tape or a ruler, you have a point of reference. So I'm guessing, just for you to know, it's about 12 inches of cooking spoon. So when I'm sawing, I can use the tension here of this shoulder to pull back. off just one end right now um, because I can cut this end off once I've split the log. When you're splitting your log, in addition to paying attention to knots, of which I took off the big one, this is kind of the remainder of that shape here, um, you want to split the log down the middle. You want an equal weight of wood on either side of your split. Um, and this is because when you put something into the wood, it's trying to find the easiest way out. And so if I split over here, this piece is going to split off and it's not going to go down the middle. Even when you split an equal weight, it's still possible that it doesn't make an even split. Some of that depends on the kind of wood and how it grew. Um, so. It's a learning process, but that is a note to pay attention to, is to 
split the log as evenly as you can. So in this case, okay, I'll, you also want to look at shape. So it's wider this way. And so if more room for the eating spoon, I think I want to put it on this side here. I'm going to split it this way. You can use the fro, in which case I would gently place it on here and hit the fro with the mallet. But because a lot of people don't have fros, I'm going to show you with an ax instead. So when I'm axing, using an ax to split a log, I will place my ax with my non-dominant hand and I will make sure that it's um, parallel to me so that when it swings out, it doesn't hit my leg. If I stand like this and the ax swings out, it has a higher chance of injuring me, which is something we're always trying to avoid. So I have my mallet. Um, it's good to practice with the mallet a swing kind of over your shoulder because then the weight of the log is doing the work and you're not lifting and pounding. Both have a place, but I recommend. So that first tap is to kind of set the ax into the wood. You can see it's cracking pretty evenly, so I'm happy with that. So this is a little too high. So I gently knock that down. The more you learn, the more you adjust things and learn as you go. Okay. Careful when you remove your ax. And it was a beautiful split. So I can easily get two good spoons out of this. I'm going to use this one right now because I like how wide it is here. Okay, so we're gonna work with this for our cooking spoon. Okay, I'm gonna get a little closer for this part to show you. Depending on how you orient your spoon in the wood, you're going to get a different effect. So in this case, my spoon, the bowl, is going to be facing away from the center, towards the outside of the log. And when you do this, if you can imagine and know the rings here and you're carving into it, you get this um, ripple effect, you know, if you drop something in water. So you have the concentric rings moving through the bowl. And so this one wasn't angled perfectly. It was more off center like this. So that's why this, the rings are off to the side a bit. Now, if I carve into a piece of wood, this is a section of a larger log. So this one was much larger. The rings are straighter. And so this is a small example, but you can see that the lines go down the handle and the spoon. Um, and those are the rings. So it's sitting in the tree sideways like this. So you have facing the outside towards the bark and you have face or er, sitting within the log, like around the log. It's a little hard to visualize with what I have right now doing the best. If you were to flip this the other way, you would have half moons on either side. So you can choose to do that specifically for style. Um, the one that we're doing now is going to have the rings. Initially, they won't be very obvious because it's a fairly white, consistent colored wood. Uh, but it's a fun thing to know. Okie dokie. So the very first thing I'm going to do <clears throat> is a step that 
took a bit more learning for me, but I want to show you so that you know what's possible. So if you look at these spoons, there's a curve in here. And this bottom part, the lowest part of the curve is called the crank. And you know, this helps a shallower bowl hold more. It also, it feels nicer to work with. Um, a lot of the spoons that we have that you cook with that you might buy from the store are pretty flat and straight. Um, so establishing crank, I think, makes it feel, it's much more comfortable and ergonomic. And particularly when you're doing eating spoons, the feel, you know, working with a very flat spoon is not very comfortable to eat with. So, the first thing I'm going to do, I want that lowest part to be more or less two thirds down the bowl. So, one third, two third, the bottom of the second third, or between the second and third part, okay? This is the bowl of the spoon. This is the neck area, and this is the handle for spoon anatomy. <laughs> so that's a few inches. I can eyeball it right now. That's the, going to be the lowest part of my crank. The first thing I want to do is break up the fibers a bit. So I've just started to break the fibers that are running this way a bit. It releases some tension. Now I'm lifting the log up for a steeper angle not too steep so that you're straight up and down. So that's getting deep enough. I'd like to take some off the handle as well so that it comes from the end of the handle down into the bottom of the crank and then back up towards the top of the spoon. So I'm going to do these short hits that are called uh, relief cuts, um, or, you know, I've just blinked on it. <laughs> I'll tell you when I remember. Relief cuts works. You're relieving the tension in the fibers that are running from one end of the log to the other down the rings. That is the strongest part of the log. This orientation, you know, breaking a log like this would be much harder, which I can't do it, than breaking a small piece against, you know, splitting the grain doing this. Okay. If you think of like pages of a book, it's easier to open a book splitting like with the grain than it is to rip a book in half. Very obviously. <laughs> so doing these up and I don't go any higher than this. My hand, you'll notice, is out of the way. My thumb is not wrapped around the log. Keep your thumb back. There's this slight, I'm gripping with my hand. I'm not too tense because we tend to be less stable when we're really tense. So there needs to be um, some fluidity, some movement. Basic X practice to start getting comfortable with the movement of an axe in your hand. It can be intimidating, I know. It's a sharp object and you're swinging. Swinging a sharp object can be scary to start. So also, you might notice 
that I have my dominant leg back so that I also, if the ax mix, misses the block, I swing with it. It's that fluid movement. If I'm totally like this, I have more likelihood that the ax will swing into my leg, which you want to avoid. So come here and then I'm going to bring it a little more steep and take, take some material off. That's so far. You can see this is the lowest point. This one isn't super significant. You don't need it to be very deep. Making something like a ladle, you'll need it deeper. And it's also better with something that's very deep to have a piece of wood that's actually naturally curved because then the grain will be running more through the piece, which gives it more strength and less likelihood to break. I'll take a little more off. So with time, you want to work to take off large flakes of wood. It's much more efficient. Um, it's much more efficient and easier on your body and the whole process. So at first, it's gonna seem like they're little pieces. It's gonna feel like a lot of work. It's good to rest and stretch. And with time, you'll make larger flakes. It's what you're aiming for, except when you get to the finer detail. You also want to work on one flat surface, one plane. I don't want this to be wavy or different angles yet. I want there to be, it's going to be a fairly square piece of work as you'll, I'll show you. And it's much easier to make something round from something that's square than kind of chasing the shape without keeping um, right angles. And of course there's exceptions in the whole process. So next, in order to take this top part off and bring the tip, the like end of the bowl to the bottom of the crank here. So what I'm gonna do, this is a little bit of a funny angle because there's this shoulder here. Um, you'll still get the point. So I have the piece pressed against my arm. My fingers are well out of the way and I have the ax block here to hit and I'm Coming down at a bit of an angle. I'm not really angling the axe. I'm gonna angle so that I'm always working with the axe on the same field. Um, I'm not rotating my wrist. And once you start getting a piece, you follow that. If this movement is uncomfortable with the, for you, it takes practice. It took me a, quite a while to learn it, um, but it can be very efficient. When you're learning, take your time, listen to your body. Don't do something that feels dangerous. Okay, so here, I hope you can see that there's a high point at the end of the handle, down to the bottom of the bowl or the bottom of the crank, up to the tip of the bowl of the spoon. There's a little bit of a funny shape up here, but I'll take care of that later, either with the ax or the knife. I'm not worried about it right now. Not for the purpose of showing you. When you set your ax down, either put the sheath on it or set it on a log. You don't want it to touch dirt. And also 
Um, hitting it and balancing it in your axe block is false security because you can bump it and it can fall and hit your toes. So please be careful with your tools for their safety and for your safety. So here is my template and I'm going to put this on here and trace trace it. I may, I will probably trace it another time when more of the bark is off. This is a rough tracing. You're not creating fine art right now. More or less, I can, it could even be a little wider. Okay. If you don't have a template, if you haven't made one, something else you can do is you can take a ruler, you can eyeball, and I like to draw a line down the center and then, excuse me, <laughs> let's see. So I might draw a line down the center and then more or less shape a bowl come around this side. Do something like this. Draw a handle. Again, you see it's pretty rough. I hope you can see that and the pencil's not too light. That's, if you don't have a template, you haven't made one, you can freehand it. It's good to practice. Some people don't use templates at all. Some people totally rely on templates. The next step, you're going to take your folding saw. First, I'm gonna show you. <laughs> and we're going to make a saw cut around here. You don't want to take it all the way into the neck for, because you don't want to, um, encroach too closely to that or else you could make the neck too thin and you want to leave room for the knife work so I'll make this a little darker hopefully it's visible for you okay this is where I'm sawing This is essentially another way of those relief cuts, which we're going to do, um, we may do again, but you don't need to do that. I would use those relief cuts if I didn't have a saw to take off material by the handle. So I'm going to saw, I'm going to lay it flat. Again, keep your hands out of the way. And I'm paying attention that the cutting edge of the saw down here is per or, uh, perpendicular, is that right? At a right angle to the wood and not tilted in either direction because then you will come into the neck unintentionally in the front or the back. So practice keeping your saw either straight up and down like this or like this, and you can lower yourself to look at the level. Okay, now this one. having to look over because I don't have a mark on the back. I could guesstimate a mark on the back, but. So for now, 
I'm gonna say that is close enough. So I've made two saw cuts in towards the neck, but I've stopped well outside of my pencil mark or pen mark or whatever. So next, I'm gonna take my ax. Put it in my non-dominant hand and place it in line with the inside of that saw cut but also not narrower than the end of your spoon which a lot of spoons are wider at the end of the handle not all of them so you are going to try and just take this off in one piece ideally may or may not come off in one piece. It may go out because in this case, you know, there's not, so there isn't an equal weight of wood on either side of the ax. So this may run out, but this hopefully will give it some direction. Look, again. Now, as I'm doing this, I'm holding the ax, but I'm not gripping it too tight because I want the ax to be able to come out and not hit anything below the saw mark. If you bump that, you can send a hairline fracture that you might not see at all until you're carving later and part of the bowl breaks off. Most times I've ever seen a spoon crack is because of something that happened in the ax work or the log already had a crack in it. I personally rarely experience that it cracks because it dries too fast. Yeah, that just really doesn't happen very often with spoons because there's not much mass to the piece. Um, and there's also ways to prevent cracking by keeping it moist in a plastic bag or in the refrigerator, in the freezer, somewhere cool. Okay, so that worked. That piece just popped off right here. Potentially even use this for a teaspoon or something. I'm gonna do the same on the other side. Doesn't always have to fly. Okay. So this one went a little more off to the side. There's still material here. More material on this side than that side. But we can fix that. So now <laughs> we're gonna work on re removing, I do the material around the neck first. And I'm going to do those relief cuts. Stop cuts is the other word. That's what it is, I forgot. <laughs> so silly. Okay. Not going higher than that. You don't even need to go that high. You don't need to get that close to your hand. So these cuts are at a lower angle, a wider angle, a deeper angle. <laughs> um, coming up, my hand is, my wrist is loose. I'm not holding my wrist super tight. There's bounce in my wrist. There's bounce in my knees. And then I come at a steeper angle, smaller hits. As I'm going down, I will wedge my ax out a bit and that helps pop off some material. And I want to be careful the closer I'm getting to this because I don't want the ax to hit that part. Something that you can do, if the ax has a, a solid place to rest, you can lift the whole piece 
I'm not pushing down with the axe, I'm just holding it in place and bump it and it'll pop off. So I can't go much farther right now because it might send a fracture into there or I'm not going to. Um, again, I want you to pay attention to keeping as much of a right angle as you can. So I have this top surface, I have the side surfaces and I have the back surface. Clearly it's not perfectly square, but Aiming for that will help your process of keeping it symmetrical and easier to work with. You know, when I'm explaining all of the parts about keeping something square, it feels like I'm putting you into a box. But you know, I really believe that like once you learn the rules, then you can learn how to break them. And yeah, it's much easier because you build the muscles <laughs> to know what you're doing. So. Now, I will refine this a bit towards the end. Right now, I'm not worried about it. I want to take off these pieces on the side. So, this isn't quite wide enough here, but I can use, there's a notch here in my axe block, and I can rest my spoon in there because I want to keep the ax as much um, at the, at a right angle to the ax block. And um, not necessarily to the piece, I want to move the piece and not the ax and go sideways as much as I can. So my ax is straight and I can cut down So see, took off that corner. There's a little bit here. Can take that off, refine it. You don't have to get this close to the line. I think as you practice, you can try getting closer and closer to the line because it means less work with the knife. Um, an ax is more efficient for not every job of the spoon carving process, but in removing the bulk of material, the ax is more efficient. I sometimes suggest to people just ax out blanks and don't do it necessarily for the purpose of them becoming spoons. Hopefully they will, but if you, you know, take it too far, you know how far that is, and then you can dial it back a little bit. But if you leave too much material for the knife work, your hands will be very tired and it'll just be much harder on your body. So now I'm going to do the other side. You won't be able to see it because it's facing me, obviously. <laughs> So now I have both these corners off. At this point, 
Now that I've broken some of these fibers here closer to the neck, I might come back and take some off the neck, but this is fairly wide right now. So I'm gonna take some of the bulk off the back of the spoon. So if this is my deepest point, and it's probably not gonna be that deep, I'm still gonna take some material off. Unless you want it to be a deeper serving spoon, you can do that. Come up, and right now I'm gonna keep it fairly square. You don't have to make pencil marks, but for you to be able to see what I'm doing, and as you're starting, I think making a mark and being like, okay, I'm not going to cross that line as best you can, um, it helps you have something to visualize and see what you're following. So I am removing this material here on this side. Clear? <laughs> um, Similarly, on the back of the spoon, I'm going to remove material here, more or less. So this part. So again, with the stop cuts, this shoulder is really great to have somewhere to lean your spoon. You don't want it to be too steep or else it slips but floating around on a flat ax block can be can have its challenges it's totally possible but it's great to make your tools work best for you for the project that you're working on Ooh, see leg back So here's that line. I was showing you that way. Here's that line. <clears throat> I've gotten pretty close to it. I can do the same here on taking off the back of the spoon bowl. Now in this case, right now, because this is so wide, scratch that. <laughs> First, I'm gonna come in here Make sure you see the edge of your spoon. <clears throat> Similar to how we broke off material from this end down, but with the bump cut, I'm going to, excuse me, <laughs> place my ax gently. I'm not going to swing the ax in ever <laughs> into the end grain because aiming, um, you're just more likely to mess up. So place your ax whenever you're setting your ax into the end of end grain being the top of the grain. So this is end grain, this is end grain, this is end grain. You know, holding a book up, that would be like the equivalent of end grain of wood is where the page is open. So I set it here and bump it. You can also ax it, but why I find bumping it first, because axing into here, it's harder to uh, aim right, like I just said twice. <laughs> Taking that off a bit. There's a corner there for me to remove. I'm gonna do the same on the other side. The bump cuts are also less energy saving energy. <laughs> so now this isn't as wide, so it's a little easier to work with, but I th I'm still going to, I'm going to cut corners here. I had said before to keep things at right angles, but in this case, I'm going to just like here, if I split this down the middle, I'm going to take off this corner and this corner, and then it'll be easier for me to take off the center. Okay. 
a trick here. It's good to keep your axe block clean, but be careful that you set down the axe, hold it in the other hand and your hand away so that it's not close together. Um, in this case, you know, the back of a bowl is rounded. So, like I said, you wanna keep your ax as much as you can in the same plane, straight up and down. So you move your spoon while axing. It's a little bit like patting your head and rubbing your belly. <laughs> move your spoon while axing and you get more of a curved finish already. Like so. Looks good to me. Now I'm gonna do this side. I look from the end, I can see how even that is. It's nice see having that line in the middle, I could follow it between the two. I'm not guessing center as I'm axing. Of course, with practice, that becomes easier. Uh, but in this case, it was nice to have a visual and it was much easier to take off the same amount on either side at more or less the same angle. This, having the even shaped surfaces helps in the knife work and you're going to do something similar in the knife work before you really round the shape you're going to work with these angles it's easier to follow um, and keep track of what you're doing so now I want to take off this corner I don't need it start from the lowest part of the crank And I can again move the spoon as I'm axing. There we go. It's still probably more material than I need, but that's pretty great. Now, axing the top here can be a little more challenging for some people. So you can start with making a spatula shape. You don't even need to make the top round. You could do it with the knife if you want to. Um, before that, I want to take off this bit here and I want to take some off the top. First, I'm going to take off this corner. Now this notch I have here is pretty great because my spoon almost fits. <laughs> little, little motions for small areas. Or as one of my favorite teachers, she says, dainty cuts. These are the dainty cuts. I bring my hand up, I'll put my finger on the ax, and it feels easier to do little cuts like that. Yeah, and a little more. Again, you don't have to get this close. Um, what you'll find in your process is you'll get to a step, you might sit down, start using your knife and realize there's a lot of material left on here. You can take it back to the ax block, remove more material, and you'll learn where you need to take your spoon blank to with more practice. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, it's a little bit uneven. Yeah. 
So I'm getting really close to the line. It's still there. <laughs> don't worry about that. You don't have to get that close. I'm going to potentially redraw this later. Um, another carver's advice that I also really respect is that when you use something like a Sharpie is it makes a fatter line around your template. So when you ax, you ax to the edge of the Sharpie and then when you're ready to go carve, you will take the template again and trace it in pencil, which will bring it much closer to the size of the shape. You still have room to carve and you're good to go. Some of these templates are already a little bigger than what I want my final project to be. So you can also do that, make your templates slightly larger than the final spoon. And then you're also set that way. Okay, let's take off the top. I'm really doing the same skills I was doing at any other time. It's gonna be harder for you to see based on the angle, but I'm going to move the spoon a little bit to about halfway, flip it and come the other direction. going to take it all the way because I'm going to show you something else you can do. Use the tools you got. You can saw this part off which is much easier because then you can get the line that you want. Don't need to fiddle with the axe. Right now I have this shape, I have this little point up here, which I, I like because imagine you're stirring a pot and that gets the corners of the pot that a round spoon is harder to get. So it can be very useful to have a um, misshapen circle, an off-center circle. This isn't even a circle, it's kind of, this one's narrower at the bottom than it is at the top. These are wider at the bottom. Uh, this is wider at the end than it is at the neck. This one's wider at the bottom of the bowl than it is at the tip. <laughs> okay, so now the biggest thing I have left is this material still going down the handle. And I'm gonna do this carefully because I really don't wanna hit anything on there. I can come back in with short stop cuts. That's good enough. Hitting your ax out a little bit lets things pop off. You don't need to take your ax too close the parts you don't want to hit. Okay, this is pretty good. I like it, I feel good about it. There's a bit of bark, but I'm gonna take down the top of the bowl here. I'm not worried right now, it's extra long. You know, my template actually ends there, but I might keep it like this. I think having an extra long handle for those deep pots, it's great. I don't actually have many of those. I also don't have many deep pots. <laughs> I live in a van with my husband and so, 
most of our things are small. Okay. Okay, so here you have a finished spoon blank. Um, at this point, if I needed to stop and I couldn't do knife work right away, I can stick it in a plastic bag and then I can put that in the fridge. Um, if it's gonna be a really long time, you can put it in the freezer and it will keep it green, but you wanna make sure that it is sealed in a plastic bag because um, if you've probably noticed, the freezer and the fridge can dehydrate things. Um, it's less likely to crack, but I would put it in a plastic bag. You can also put it in a plastic bag put it somewhere cool, keep it out of the sun. Um, be warned if you put it in a plastic bag without putting it in a fridge particularly, um, or a freezer, is if it's there for a long time, it can start to rot or spalt. Spalting is the fungus, the action of fungus growing through the wood grain. It can be quite prominent in a lot of pieces. It can be very beautiful, but it also weakens the wood. So you don't want that to go too far. So be aware of that. And yeah, stay tuned in the next video. I will show you how to work with a straight knife and a hook knife to carve this into a spoon. If you have any questions, please put them below. I'll also put my contact information so you can send me a message on Instagram or email and I'll be happy to support you as best that I can. I absolutely love spoon carving and I think more people will enjoy it too. I'm not even looking at the camera. So <laughs> I hope, I just realized that I haven't been looking at the lens. Um, anything else? There are so many other projects you can do with Greenwood, um, so I really encourage you to check it out, try it, get your hands on some tools, and make a spoon. See you next time. Oh. Focus. Why do you do that?